person who uh, the person who um, uh, had the biggest impact here was uh, James uh, Maxwell. Um, he uh, really ought to be a great deal more famous than uh, he actually is. Um, he's, uh, for instance, one of the uh, uh, great uh, discoveries he made was um, uh, his analysis of uh, Saturn's rings. Um, and beforehand, they really didn't know whether Saturn's rings were solid or whether they were made of a, a fluid or, um, or, or what. And he did a lot of uh, mathematical analysis on this and uh, was able to prove that uh, a solid uh, rings wouldn't be stable. Um, liquid rings would end up uh, um, forming into uh, globules and uh, it had to be made up, up of, out of um, thousands or millions of uh, small particles, which of course today we now know that he was absolutely correct. But uh, for, uh, for our talk, we're interested in his uh, discoveries uh, on uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation. Um, so uh, he did a, he was um, figuring out the, uh, the equations that uh, governed uh, magnetic and uh, electric fields. And he realized that uh, if you had a, a fluctuating uh, electric and magnetic field, you could end up uh, forming a wave that would be uh, self-sustaining. Um, and he did lots of uh, calculations and he discovered that such a wave in a vacuum would travel at exactly the speed of light. And at this point he realized that uh, light actually was an electromagnetic wave. Um, he, he uh, had a, unfortunately had quite a short life. He, he died fairly young, which I think is a great shame because um, he was so talented. And since his equations that he discovered on electromagnetic waves actually led Einstein to the uh, theory of uh, relativity, I can't help wondering if Maxwell had lived longer, whether he might have been the uh, discoverer of uh, relativity. So. Uh, Hence, we know uh, from uh, Maxwell's work that light is definitely an electromagnetic wave. And uh, for uh, optics, that's important. If, if light was a stream of particles, optics wouldn't work. So uh, uh, your camera lens or uh, the mirror in your telescope just wouldn't work. Um, they rely on the light being a wave. So we're now going to look at um, a perfect uh, camera that uh, detects um, electromagnetic waves. So in this diagram, we've got um, the, uh, the sensor and each square is a, a pixel on that sensor. Um, so each square is uh, detecting the uh, intensity, uh, the amplitude of the uh, electromagnetic wave at that uh, uh, point on the sensor. And it's, uh, converting the light energy, it's um, using that to uh, um, uh, push an electron into the uh, um, pixel well. So brighter parts of the image, uh, brighter parts of the image will end up causing uh, that pixel well to end up accumulating more uh, electrons. And by doing that, you get uh, a, a bigger and bigger voltage, um, depending on how light, much light fell on that uh, pixel. Oops, sorry, I've just lost my notes. I'll be uh, back there in a moment. Now, the, uh, the great thing about uh, the uh, uh, classical physics when it comes to uh, cameras is that um, with such a perfect camera, um, if you're trying to uh, image uh, an ultra faint uh, galaxy, you could perhaps take a, a one second exposure or you could take a, a six hour exposure. And the only difference would be how bright the image was. In the one second, it would be really quite dark. 
the six hour one, it would be uh, nice and uh, visible. But all you need to do to make the two images identical is just increase the, um, uh, the amplification. So you can see in the diagram that a yellow triangle represents the uh, pre-amplifier uh, built into the uh, detector, into the uh, camera. Um, and that's effectively the, uh, uh, the gain, or uh, on a DSLR, it's referred to as the uh, ISO. So all you'd need to do is increase the ISO and your one second exposure will look identical to your uh, six hour exposure. So absolutely fantastic. But then uh, Einstein uh, came along and uh, discovered the, uh, uh, or explained the uh, photoelectric effect. So he published a, a paper on this in uh, 1905 and uh, ended up winning the uh, Nobel Prize uh, for the uh, photoelectric effect. Um, he uh, spent his, his uh, acceptance uh, speech talking about relativity, but he didn't win it for relativity. He won it for the uh, photoelectric effect. I wonder if they thought relativity was just a bit too weird and uh, were a bit worried about awarding him anything for that, just in case it got disproved in the uh, uh, soon after. But anyway, the, uh, what he discovered um, is that um, Classical physics just couldn't explain this phenomena. So what happens is you, you shine light at a, a metal and uh, the light ends up giving electrons in the metal uh, extra energy. Uh, and if the electron gets enough energy, it will be ejected from the metal and you can detect it. Um, but the strange thing was, was that red light would produce no electrons whereas blue or, or uh, ultraviolet light would produce lots. Now in classical physics, the only thing that matters is how much energy your uh, EM wave has. And that's just the, uh, the amplitude. It's a bit like going um, surfing. Uh, if you uh, um, have a, a one meter uh, wave, you're gonna have plenty of energy and it's gonna push you towards the beach. Whereas a, a one millimeter ripple is going to uh, really be uh, quite underwhelming. So the red light, you should just be able to turn up the brightness of the lamp and that should be enough. But that wasn't the case, no matter how bright it was, it would never produce electrons. Whereas the blue light, you could turn down the intensity as much as you liked and it would reduce the rate the electrons were emitted, but they were still every now and again, no matter how faint you made it, they would still be emitted. And classical physics just could not explain this at all. So it was Einstein's brilliance that realized that light might end up traveling as an electromagnetic wave, but when it interacts with matter, it behaves like it's a stream of particles called uh, photons. And then the, uh, the explanation was quite straightforward. The photons in red light have less energy than the photons in uh, blue light. Um, so it's a bit like being at the fair and you've got uh, some uh, cans of beer that you need to uh, uh, knock over. And if you throw um, ping pong balls uh, at it, it doesn't matter how hard you throw it, it's, um, it's just never gonna knock it over. Whereas the blue photons are more like golf balls, which will uh, do the trick rather nicely. So we've got this strange situation that our camera lens requires light to be a wave or they wouldn't work. And our detector requires that light is a, a particle or it wouldn't work. Um, so in fact, it, it turns out that it's impossible to uh, detect an electromagnetic, electromagnetic wave directly at all. Light always interacts as particles. Um, And this has a, a very large impact on uh, the capability of our uh, perfect camera. So this is a, a simulation of uh, what a perfect camera would end up uh, actually uh, um, detect, detect 
depending on uh, what the, uh, the light level is. So we've now gone through the physics, which uh, if physics wasn't your thing, you can uh, now uh, wake up again and uh, pay attention. And we'll start talking about uh, um, real things that affect uh, how astrophotography uh, ends up working. So what we have here is uh, if we look at um, each uh, image in turn from the uh, top left to the uh, bottom right, uh, each image has 10 times the uh, amount of light uh, in the exposure. So uh, each image has uh, detected 10 times more photons than the uh, previous image. Now, the, uh, the photons, um, we know that they're more likely to arrive in a bright area than a dim area, but their arrival is completely random. So we have no way of knowing where the next photon will actually land on our detector. And this means that if we have very, very few uh, um, photons arriving, we end up with a, um, an image that you can't make anything of it at all. It just looks like noise. Whereas if we go from the uh, top left to the um, middle left, so that's uh, um, three photos further on, we've now got a thousand times more photons. And you can see that it's, it's looking a, a very noisy image, very grainy, but we can now start to see the detail uh, in the image. And then as we move to the, uh, the bottom left, uh, again, a, a thousand times more photos, more photons than the, uh, the middle left, we can see that the image is now uh, um, showing up very nicely with uh, minimal uh, noise. Now, this type of noise is referred to as shot noise, but it's not really noise at all. It's all signal. All these speckles are all important. And if we have enough of them, they'll finally make up the, uh, the, the final image. So for instance, if you took uh, um, thousands of uh, the uh, top left uh, exposures on our perfect camera um, and averaged them all together, if you took a thousand, you would then end up with the uh, image on the uh, middle, the left of the middle row. If you took a thousand times a thousand, you'd end up with the image on the bottom left. So it's vitally important to realize that this type of noise is important. And when you learn how to use the uh, uh, software that Keith will be uh, teaching you, when you stack the images together, there'll be various data rejection that you can end up uh, applying. It's vitally important that you don't try and reject this um, salt and pepper um, uh, shot noise from the images, because if you do, you'll uh, be end up rejecting a real signal. So um, this is what a, a perfect camera will, uh, will achieve. Um, now let's suppose we have this uh, perfect uh, camera and we've made it into a, a DSLR camera and we've given it to an ordinary uh, photographer. So he's gone out to uh, take this, uh, this landscape uh, photograph. Um, and in normal photography, if you've ever done uh, DSLR photography, you have what's often referred to as the uh, exposure triangle. And that's where to get the, uh, the image to the, uh, the right brightness, you need to decide what uh, aperture to uh, end up uh, setting the camera to. And uh, the more um, of the camera's uh, lens you end up using, the brighter the image is gonna be. On the other hand, if you uh, reduce the shutter speed, then that would make the uh, photograph darker. And then the third part of the exposure triangle is um, the, uh, the gain or the uh, ISO. And that determines, we saw uh, the, uh, that's the pre-amplifier on our, um, uh, inside our camera. And all that's doing is um, uh, increasing the brightness. So the, the crucial thing here to understand is the, the ISO isn't making the camera more sensitive. It's um, 
all it's doing is making the image brighter. So um, if we took a, a photograph, say the middle row on the left, it's a dark image and we increase the ISO to make it uh, visible. So it's so that our JPEG image straight from the camera um, is uh, the right sort of brightness level. So we can see that our perfect camera still produces noisy results if we had to rely on a higher ISO in order to brighten up the, uh, the image. But it's not the ISO that's introducing the noise. It's simply brightening the image. So our perfect camera, the ISO, has no effect on the noise whatsoever. The signal to noise ratio is, uh, is exactly the same. So uh, I wonder if I could uh, open it up for uh, a few questions on, on this, just to make sure that people understand what I'm referring to as uh, how ISO uh, affects us on, on the uh, perfect camera. So if I uh, stop sharing for a moment. Um, so, so John, a question then, that, that middle image, that the one that had missing pixels in effect, Yep. if you turn up the ISO, what happens to those missing pixels? So in this uh, middle, can you see my uh, cursor? Mm -hmm. Yep. So in this uh, middle image, if you um, uh, increase the ISO, um, the, the the graininess of the image is unchanged. All that happens is the image gets brighter. If you turn down the ISO, again, same level of graininess, it just gets darker. That's all the ISO does. It so doesn't, it doesn't give you more data? No. So the okay. data yeah. was entirely determined by how many photons were okay. actually detected on yeah. the actual sensor. And the ISO plays no role on that whatsoever. That makes sense. Okay. So, so, so why do we turn up the ISO then when it's dark? So this, uh, if you're um, uh, a photographer with a normal DSLR camera, um, you uh, have decided on a particular uh, aperture and shutter speed. Perhaps the aperture was to give you the right level of uh, depth of uh, field. The shutter speed was so that you could uh, hand hold it. But when you um, do the, the, uh, the calculation, your, um, the exposure meter on your camera tells you that you're going to be underexposed. You've got 10 times too little light. So you'll end up, if you take that photograph, you'll end up with a very dark image on your JPEG that will be 10 times darker than it should be. So you turn up the ISO from ISO 100 to ISO 1000, and then the image will be 10 times brighter. So the JPEG will look the right brightness, but you underexposed the actual detector. So all the pixel wells were, uh, the brightest ones were only a 10th of their full capacity instead of full. So that's where the underexposure happened. You've, you've compensated it with the ISO, so you get the bright image out, but the noise there isn't from the amplifier. It's simply because you underexposed the actual sensor. So you've got all this shot noise in there because you just didn't have enough photons. Their random or random arrival is still showing up as uh, as noise as uh, speckle. Okay, so 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 the, the dark spaces are simply because no light has fallen on that pixel. That's right. And it doesn't matter how much you amplify it; there's still no light. Absolutely, exactly right. right. Um, and when you get higher exposure levels you might find that all the pixels now have detected something, but some of them will have detected more of the image than others because of the random arrival. So eventually, when you've uh, got to the bottom right uh, image, you have so many photons collected that the um, some still will statistically have a few more than others, but it will be undetectable. It will be, uh, um, it will make very little difference. Whereas if you've got somewhere, say the, uh, um, the middle row to the left, then some pixels might have had um, uh, two photons detected when they should have had three. And of course, two thirds is quite a big uh, percentage. Yeah. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this means, John, that if you stacked those uh, multiple versions of the same image, uh, that will effectively increase the exposure without any further disadvantage. 
Absolutely, exactly right. So, but it has to be a perfect camera. Yeah, a perfect camera. Yes. So, if we took the top left uh, a photo, and we stacked a thousand of these photos, each one of those thousand images will be different. They'll they'll look much the same, but each uh, dot will be in a different place because of the uh, the random arrival. But if we stack a thousand of them together, we will get the uh, middle row left image. So when we talk about stacking a thousand, we're not talking about stacking a thousand of the same image. No. So there are a thousand exposures. That's right, yes. Correct. If we stacked a thousand, obviously all we'd get is the, the yes. same dots, but they would be brighter. So they have to be a thousand different images. Right. Um, so we could either just expose for a, a thousand times longer, or we can take each of those one, one thousandth of an exposure and sum them all together and we get exactly the same thing in the end um, because we'll have the same number of photons detected either way. So uh, is, uh, is that uh, as clear as it can be now? This, this is a really complicated area, which is why I wanted to uh, open it up for discussion uh, before I move on. It's good, John. Yep, no, it's, okay. It's good, yes. Good for me, right. thank you. Okay, so um, the, uh, the perhaps the uh, um, the really surprising thing is that uh, digital cameras are actually extremely close to being perfect cameras. The difference is is actually quite small. Um, it's really absolutely remarkable, but the vast majority of noise that you see in calibrated images is down to this uh, shot noise, is due to the random arrival of the photons. Um, I, I can't stress this enough. Uh, you, would, you would think that most of the noise was actually from your camera itself, but it's not. It's, we are so close to actually having perfect cameras. The, the major difference is with the um, quantum efficiency. So uh, the sort of camera you're likely to uh, buy off the shelf is likely to have a quantum efficiency of about 50%. So maybe it's only detecting half the photons. Um, and that would mean that you'd need to expose for twice as long compared to uh, a perfect camera. Um, but having exposed for twice as long, you're gonna get pretty much the same result. Um, the, uh, this shot noise, this random arrival of the photons is the dominant form of noise in our uh, images, which, yeah, I, I find just uh, completely astonishing that our, our detectors uh, are really are this, this amazingly uh, good. And that's why with a, a normal DSLR camera, that's why people think that raising the ISO increases the noise and it doesn't. Um, it's simply that you're, um, uh, you've, is compensating for you having underexposed the uh, the sensor, and that noise that you th that lots of people think is due to the high ISO is actually due to it's just really um, revealing that random arrival of, uh, of photons. So the question must come then: if you lower the ISO, there must be a disadvantage somewhere. Now there is, yes. So uh, that's uh, definitely a, a good uh, question. Uh, why, why supply an ISO? What ISO? Why does it matter? So we know why it matters for a normal photographer, because if they don't want to do any processing on their image, they want their JPEG image to be the right brightness. Mm -hmm. And the ISO is there to, uh, to ensure that that happens. Um, but there are other advantages of having a, a high ISO in low light conditions. Although it doesn't increase the camera's sensitivity, it doesn't change um, how many uh, photons are, are detected at all. Um, higher ISO values actually end up reducing the uh, small amount of noise that the camera actually adds. Now, I know that's counterintuitive. People are so um, so set on the idea that high ISOs introduce noise. It's, it's um, sort of so counterintuitive that people just don't believe me. But it, for most cameras, the noisiest component inside the camera is the uh, analog to digital converter. So this is um, 
we've uh, read out the tiny voltages from all the pixels. And these tiny, tiny voltages are then going through a very, very high quality amplifier. And that's the, uh, the, the gain on this amplifier is our, our ISO or, uh, or gain. And amplifiers are amazing. We, we can make really, really, really good quality amplifiers. So the extra noise that the amplifier adds is negligible. It's really tiny. But then the output of, the, uh, of this um, amplifier then gets fed into the uh, analog to digital converter. And it's the analog to digital converter that tends to be the noisiest component in a camera. So if we um, don't uh, amplify the signal very much, then we're using the, uh, the lowest levels on the analog to digital converter and that will add quite a lot of noise. Whereas if we amplify the signal first, we'll get the same amount of noise added, but now our signal might be 10 times higher. So the noise from the analog to digital converter is 10 times less significant. So by increasing the ISO, we actually make a very small improvement on the, uh, the noise of our camera but it's small compared to the shot noise. The dominant noise is still this random arrival of photons. Um, so uh, did that make uh, sense? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, so yes. Um, um, So the, uh, the other reason of using uh, a high or low ISO is that um, whereas a perfect camera would have an infinite uh, dynamic range, uh, a real camera doesn't. So uh, a poor quality DSLR camera, for instance, might have a 12-bit um, digital uh, analog to digital converter. Um, a high quality astronomical camera uh, might have a 16-bit uh, analog to digital converter. But even still, the, the dynamic range is limited. So we end up using the amplifier to decide what part of the analog signal ends up getting converted to uh, the uh, digital uh, numbers. So um, if we uh, have the uh, ISO set at uh, 100, so we've got very little uh, amplification going on, maybe the smallest voltages don't get high enough to make the first level on the uh, analog to digital converter. So we need to turn up the uh, ISO enough so that none of our image is pitch black. And as long as nothing is pitch black, then everything is, uh, is getting to the analog to digital converter. If we turn up the ISO really, really high, we've made a, a very, very small improvement on noise because it's reduced the impact that the um, uh, analog to digital converter is uh, introduced. But there's a downside to ultra high ISO, and that's that we lose dynamic range. So if you imagine the, the very brightest parts of the image, if we turn up the ISO too high, then those are going to be above the highest level that the analog to digital converter can handle. So we'll end up uh, saturating our image. So it's a compromise between having it high enough to make the extra noise the camera was adding negligible, but low enough so you've got enough dynamic range for the image you're taking. So for example, if you're taking a 10 minute exposure, then you might need more dynamic range. So you might uh, be forced to use a slightly lower ISO. Whereas if you were taking uh, 10 second uh, exposures, then your, probably none of your uh, uh, pixels will be uh, close to uh, the full well capacity. So having a much higher ISO doesn't reduce your uh, dynamic range so much. Does, does that make sense? Yes. Well, yes. question, John. What okay. is dynamic range? Right. I was about to range. ask the same, Pramod. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, having, um, yeah, because I've got a science background, a, a degree in physics, uh, I tend to forget that a lot of the things that I've uh, picked up years ago, uh, I probably wasn't born with the knowledge. Uh, 
So uh, yes, I, I forget. So a dynamic range is um, the uh, um, is a measure of how faint and how bright um, you can capture. So um, an infinite dynamic range means that you'd be able to detect the absolutely faintest thing and something as, as bright as the sun in the image at the same time. Um, so a reduced dynamic range, uh, as a real camera would have, then uh, clearly uh, you, you can't take a photograph of uh, a person with the sun properly exposed in the same photograph. The, the sun will be burnt out. It's beyond the dynamic range of the, uh, of the camera. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, John, yes. John, if I may. Yep. At yep. this point, um, just just to give everybody an idea, um, the human eye has about um, what um, fourteen what are called stops. So each stop is a doubling of light. So as John explained, that um, down the left hand side of the image here is from uh, one times to ten times to a hundred times. Yeah. So uh, we can see around about fourteen doublings of light with our eyes, which is why we can walk out into um, a forest, for example, that's quite shaded and see quite a bit of detail um, and then walk out into bright sunlight and our eyes will very quickly adapt. Cameras don't tend to do that. They tend to have around about seven stops of dynamic range, which would mean that that's quite a common misconception of, of photographers that when they point their camera at something will go, oh, well, that's not what it looked like. And the camera will be either very dark or very bright um, compared to what the human eye sees. But uh, 14 stops is about 14 times the dynamic range. So, you know, two times, two times, two times, two times, two is, is what we see. Just to give you an idea. Yeah, thanks. That's uh, quite in intriguing. Yeah, mm. really good. Um, and yeah, the uh, the eye is uh, a remarkable camera. It, it really is, and and uh, it's capable of detecting extremely low uh, light levels. Um, the only reason we we don't appreciate that is because we have a uh, effectively have a shutter speed on the eye, so we're never taking long exposures, uh, and hence uh, we can do so much more with a uh, with a camera. But given the shutter speed that our eyes working at, it's truly remarkable how sensitive it actually is. And the dynamic range is, uh, is amazing. It's um, an extraordinary bit of kit. Right, okay. So uh, having said that uh, even with our perfect camera, we uh, still have um, this, uh, our, our dominant noise is um, this uh, shot noise, this random arri arrival of, uh, of photons. Uh, we'll now move on to talk about uh, what uh, noise actually does get uh, introduced by our camera. Um, So uh, if you've been following uh, uh, Keith's uh, um, sessions for a while, I'm sure that you've been uh, introduced to uh, um, calibration frames. Um, so what I'm showing now is uh, a master dark uh, from, a, 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 from uh, my camera. This is a, a crop from uh, my uh, astronomical camera. So for anyone that's just uh, started out, um, a quick recap. Um, we can measure the noise uh, that our camera um, introduces by simply taking an image of the same length that we would have taken for uh, our uh, light frame. Uh, so for instance, this is a, a five minute exposure, um, but with a lens cap on. So there's no light uh, that's uh, introduced. Uh, so everything recorded is entirely due to the camera's noise. Um, and uh, the camera noise can be uh, um, can be considered in uh, two different ways. We have what's referred to as uh, fixed pattern noise, and that's repeatable. It's the um, it's going to have the same uh, uh, appearance in uh, every single frame we take. And then we've got uh, another aspect of 
of the noise, which is referred to as uh, random noise. And that's completely unpredictable. It's going to be uh, different on, on every image. So ideally, we'd love to uh, remove both the random noise uh, and the fixed pattern noise uh, from the images that we've actually taken. Um, unfortunately, we can't. There's nothing we can do about the random noise, but we can subtract the fixed pattern noise. So we end up taking uh, uh, lots of dark frames, as many as you can be bothered, really. Uh, I tend to uh, leave the camera going and take about 50. And then by averaging them all together, we can average the, um, the random noise out so that we're left with the, uh, the fixed pattern noise. So this is the fixed pattern noise uh, from, my, uh, from my own camera. Now, when I said earlier that uh, modern cameras have got really close to the uh, um, ideal camera, I was really talking about calibrated images. So if we didn't calibrate the images, then the, uh, the noise introduced, uh, at least on some cameras, uh, would be uh, quite significant. But once we've removed the, uh, the fixed pattern noise, we're then, uh, uh, we're then in that wonderful situation, which uh, uh, is the shot noise that dominates. So, okay, this is our, our master dark. This uh, contains our, our fixed, um, fixed noise. Um, so what I've done now is I've taken a single dark frame and I've subtracted the master dark from it. Um, so now what we're left with is just the random noise. Um, and this was really to illustrate uh, the, uh, the noise that uh, we're left with. This has no use in, in processing. I just wanted to show you uh, what noise actually uh, comes from the camera that we can't do anything about. So the, sing the single dark had both the fixed pattern noise and the random noise. The master dark, because we averaged out the random noise, only contains the fixed pattern noise. We subtract one from the other, we're just left with the random noise. So we can see lots of uh, speckle, and this time that's not due to uh, the random arrival of photons. We've got the lens cap on, we don't get any photons. Um, and that's just noise, thermal, probably thermal noise from the, uh, the camera. We can uh, also see um, some uh, blotches, some blobs on the uh, frame. And uh, these are uh, referred to as cosmic ray strikes. And some of them actually are um, due to uh, cosmic rays. These uh, cosmic rays are uh, high energy particles coming from outer space. So they might have been created in uh, uh, supernova explosions or uh, um, uh, really uh, energetic, violent uh, um, events uh, out in the, in the galaxy or even from other galaxies. Uh, they're particles that are traveling uh, extremely close to the speed of light and uh, they're zapping through us uh, all the time. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the atmosphere takes uh, a lot of them out, but, but many still reach us. And indeed, if you uh, are lucky enough to spend time on the uh, International Space Station, you'll then get zapped by a lot more uh, cosmic rays without the uh, atmosphere's protection. And then uh, you get so many and they're so energetic that you can see spots of light when you've got your eyes closed. However, said although some of them are due to uh, cosmic ray strikes, some of them are actually down to uh, the cover glass that's uh, on top of the uh, um, your uh, detector. And although they try and make the cover glass as uh, pure as they possibly can, um, it still has impurities in there. And some of those impurities are actually radioactive. And it's the radioactivity that also produces these uh, blotches that uh, look much the same as a cosmic ray strike. Now, uh, this image um, is um, from uh, uh, a DSLR camera. And the image on the left is a, a dark frame, a single uh, dark frame um, that was taken while the uh, camera was still uh, uh, fairly cool. Whereas the image on the right is taken after uh, using the camera for 10 minutes on uh, live view. Uh, 
and uh, it's quite common for uh, astrophotographers to use live view because it's just so convenient for uh, focusing. So uh, with the live view, you can either see the, uh, the live picture on your um, uh, uh, laptop, or you can see it on the uh, LCD on the back of your uh, camera. And then you can look at the, uh, the bright star that you've centered and uh, adjust the uh, focus accordingly. Um, but unfortunately, this constant reading out of the, um, uh, the sensor many times a second ends up heating up the, uh, the sensor. And as sensors get hotter, the thermal noise ends up increasing. So we can see that uh, um, it's had a really bad effect and it will continue to have a, a bad effect for a long time. It takes the camera a long time to uh, cool down after this uh, heating up. So my advice is if that you do use a, a DSLR camera, if you can, you're much better off using uh, JPEGs for um, focus images rather than live view. And that way you'll heat up the camera less and you'll get a lot less noise in your final images. I would recommend in, uh, for this using JPEGs just because they download from the camera faster. And uh, if you've got a slow download, you can even use uh, um, a medium or low quality uh, JPEG. Um, and uh, once you've uh, finished focusing, you then switch back to raw mode to actually uh, take the, uh, the final images. This also illustrates that um, the uh, hot pixels, and that's what these uh, bright spots in the images are. They're, they're pixels that with no light signal, they just collect electrons anyway. Uh, there's a, a leakage of electrons into those particular pixel cells, um, pixel wells. And uh, as the um, camera heats up, the rate of this leakage ends up increasing. Uh, and that's why a lot of uh, astronomical cameras use uh, set point cooling where we cool the camera down to say minus 15 or, or minus 20 degrees C, which uh, reduces this uh, um, thermal noise uh, dramatically. Then ideally we'd also take a, um, a flat field uh, calibration frame. Now, um, most people think of a flat field as purely uh, correcting the uh, via netting on the uh, telescope. So you can see this on my, my telescope, we can see that some of the corners are quite dark due to the uh, via netting that uh, occurs. And we can also see uh, dust donuts where uh, dust has uh, shadowed the, uh, the sensor. Um, so we can use this uh, flat field to uh, correct uh, all these uh, imperfections. So we get a, a nice uh, um, flat field um, image out. What's John, often- Can I ask yep. a question? Sure, Sorry to interrupt you. Um, on your Master Dark- Yep. Uh, it, it, not that one, uh, that one. Yep. Uh, you're brighter on one side than on the other. Is, is that the, maybe it's my iPad. Um, oh, no, is it that... generally is. Okay, so is that, but that's come from your camera, not from your telescope, right? So that's right, the lens cap was on, so uh, yes, that's from the camera. And uh, so, why is it brighter on one side than the other? It's simply that the um, uh, that's actually uh, in the um, readout noise. So, a dark frame uh, contains both the, the readout noise from the camera, which is the noise that was. Uh, um, uh, caused by uh, actually detecting the voltages in each uh, pixel and mm -hmm. the uh, um, uh, analog to digital converter. Um, and then the, uh, it, we've also got the, um, the uh, dark current, the, uh, the leakage of electrons into the uh, uh, pixels. So the, the uh, bright spots are due to the, uh, the leakage of uh, electrons entering the pixel mm -hmm. wells without any light. Mm -hmm. The readout noise is causing, I don't know whether you can see it, but you can see the vertical stripes. columns in here. And as you pointed yeah. out, you can see a brighter area on the left and nowhere do we have complete blackness. So uh -huh. the readout noise is causing all of this. And for some reason on my particular camera, I'm getting a, a, a greater level of readout noise on the left-hand side than I am on the right-hand side. 
Now, the good thing is that that's a predictable um, difference. So that when we subtract the master dark from our light, okay. it corrects for this uh, uh, issue uh, very nicely indeed. Sure. But if, okay. but if I wasn't sense. using master dark, then it would end up slightly brighter on the left and yeah. it shouldn't be. Yeah. But the other thing to point out is this frame is very, very heavily stretched. So um, <laughs> if, if, um, if it was a normal image, if we stretched it this far, everything would be massively overexposed. So okay. it, it, we are looking at tiny imperfections here. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas the hot pixels, um, they're actually, some of those will actually be quite bright. So uh, they're sharp, even if we hadn't stretched the image uh, really heavily. And that line that you've got over to the right hand side, is that right. a, a line of pixels that have dropped out? So um, when my camera was uh, young, it didn't have any of these at all, um, but it's yeah. now over 10 years old and it's, uh, it's gradually um, uh, getting worse. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so this is referred to as a, a column uh, defect. And sometimes okay. column defects can uh, obliterate the detail there altogether. There can be uh, no data on them at all. In my case, it's, that's not happening. It's, um, I'm still getting detail where that line is, but the readout noise on that column is much higher than it should be. So uh, we're getting this um, uh, line that's visible. Okay. Now, on some of my uh, uh, images, it seems that this line is originating from a hot pixel and it's as if the, uh, the charge is overflowing and going down the column and uh, producing this, uh, this readout error. Um, oh. You get that again, on tellies, don't you, on TVs you get, mm. and computer screens. So um, it's, uh, fortunately, it still um, subtracts out very nicely. Okay, good. But it does show <laughs> that uh, the camera is getting older. And, and indeed, the number of hot pixels I'm getting has increased as well. There are a lot more now than there used to be when the camera was young. Mm -hmm. So uh, 10 years has uh, taken its toll. John, another question on why you've got that up there. The yep. hot pixels, um, the pixel is, uh, this is a readout of mm -hmm. each individual pixel and the voltage level of it. Yep. Yeah. So where is it getting that? voltage from? Right, so with hot pixels, what, what ideally what we'd like is these uh, pixel wells, um, if no light is uh, hitting the sensor, we would like our pixel well to remain empty. Mm -hmm. We should have no electrons in there at all. Unfortunately, for some of these pixel wells, there's a, a fault on the uh, sensor, such that electrons can leak into the well without any light input at all. And it's that that causes the electrons to build up in some of the pixel wells, and that produces the hot pixel. And the sensor is what's reading each individual pixel? So yes, so then when we've taken this photograph, the, uh, the sensor, it will end up uh, going to each individual pixel on the uh, image, and it will be saying, right, th that pixel at this XY coordinate has this voltage. And that voltage will depend on the number of electrons that are in that pixel well. So ideally, that would be completely proportional to the amount of light that hit that pixel. Mm -hmm. But on these pixels that are a bit leaky, then it will be the amount of light plus the amount of electrons that managed to uh, leak in there that shouldn't have done. Got it. So John, another question from Pramod is, uh... Is that lightness to the um, left of the frame, is that amp glow? Um, amp glow um, is something that happens a lot on um, CMOS sensors. Uh, this is actually a CCD, and I don't think they um, suffer from amp glow in the same way. So in this case, no, it isn't. But amp glow would look, um, often looks quite similar. Um, this is uh, actual readout noise. I think it's probably to do with the way that CCDs are read out because they end up um, uh, cascading the data from uh, one so, pixel row to the next. And I think things can end up, uh, errors can accumulate as, as it goes. Well, I think amp glow would typically be a, a much more uh, hotspot in a particular corner of the, uh, the frame. 
typically, yes, it might be uh, uh, in the, uh, the middle or it might be a, a top or bottom corner. And I think the amp glow is caused by other circuitry on the CMOS uh, detector that's um, causing uh, the uh, pixels to end up uh, getting uh, some uh, electrons into their wells. Questions? And uh, yeah, CCD cameras, they, they don't have any circuitry added to the chip, it's just a CCD. Whereas CMOS, you, have, uh, you can potentially have lots of circuitry on the uh, same chip. Um, and that has advantages and disadvantages. So it means that you can end up correcting a lot of the flaws that CMOS would otherwise have by having uh, individual transistors for every pixel. It means you can have very, very fast readout. Um, it means that you can uh, perhaps put the analog to digital converter on the same chip to reduce the noise that it introduces. But you also get the downsides of uh, amp glow if the uh, chip uh, isn't sufficiently well designed. So uh, yeah, and in the past, CCD cameras were very much the, uh, the better quality, but CMOS has gradually been developing and getting better and better. So uh, I don't think CCDs will keep their lead. Um, I suspect the professional cameras are probably still CCD maybe, but CMOS I think is gonna win in the end. And well, for think, the amateur uh, market, I think it already has. I think a lot of the, the lack of manufacturers of CCDs these days. Yeah, it, indeed. So yes, the uh, the bit that um, flat fields, uh, the, the other reason they're used, which is often uh, um, people are, are unaware of, is a, another type of noise that you can have in your image is simply that each pixel on the camera, for our ideal camera, would like every pixel to be perfectly the same sensitivity. So uh, if we uh, evenly illuminated the whole chip with light, every single pixel, uh, given enough time on average, would detect the same number of photons. But in reality, that's not quite how it goes. You'll get neighboring pixels might be slightly better uh, efficiency or slightly lower. And that in itself can end up introducing a, a, a speckle noise as well. It's probably not very obvious from the flat field because the, uh, the veer netting and the uh, dust donuts dominate. Um, but it also corrects that uh, um, difference in uh, sensitivity from pixel to pixel. So although flat fields are a real hassle to take, um, and, th and they're difficult to take as well. But they, uh, they're certainly uh, quite advantageous uh, if you do. What do you recommend as good practice for taking a flat field? Right, okay. So, um, the... Uh, I don't have a side of a caravan to take, so... Right. Uh, yeah, there are lots of different strategies. Uh, there's the expensive option, which uh, I went for, and that's to get... Um, uh, an evenly illuminated uh, panel, which I then put on top of the, uh, the telescope um, and then just take an image of that, uh, that flat panel. So it's just an evenly illuminated uh, sheet. Um, and what, what, what do you mean by sh sheet? Could I so, do it, or would it need to be through the telescope or is it just through the camera? And could yeah. I do it with like a sheet of A4 or does it have to be something big? It has to be through the optical system that you took the photographs through. Otherwise, you wouldn't pick up the vionetta okay. and the, uh, the dust donut. So it needs to be at the same oh, focus yes, of position course. and it needs to be through the, uh, the same optical system. Uh, then yeah. all, all you need is for the, uh, the whole field to be evenly illuminated. So you can get, you can buy uh, purpose-made uh, flat panels, which you can just uh, point your telescope up, um, up at the, uh, the zenith, up vertically and then just pop the uh, the panel on top of the telescope, switch it on, and it's like an, it's like an evenly illuminated uh, screen. And then you just photograph that. Some people have used uh, LED panels uh, with some success, I think, and they, they can be cheaper. Yes, tracing panels, I think they're called. Um, so that's a good tip. Um, I, I tend to use the iPad. Does that work as well? I think it should, yeah. Indeed. So what do you do with that, Pramod? Uh, just 
uh, open a blank page on the iPad, make the whole screen go white, and just pop it on top of the telescope. Oh. Which is fine if, you're, if your aperture fits inside the iPad. Um, yeah, that's... Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've got a full, I've got a full us, uh, A4 size uh, iPad, so... I just some of us only up. have small telescopes, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. It, the old-fashioned way, or I understand the old-fashioned way, was to stretch a white T-shirt or similar across the aperture. Uh, and take photos in daytime. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that works. So, so what I used to uh, do uh, there was I'd, I'd point it at a white screen with a T-shirt over the end of the telescope, a white mm. T-shirt over the telescope, and then the two combined would end up diffusing what was already fairly flat in the first place to something that was uh, very flat. So uh, yes, I think that can work. Uh, Sorry, I've Bob? certainly done that. And uh, the, the other thing, of course, is you could um, take sky flats. So in the evening before... Um, as you're perhaps setting up your gear as it's getting to twilight, as long as there aren't any clouds around, you can just uh, photograph the background sky. Or so, uh, this works particularly well for uh, camera lenses. If you have a, say, a 50 millimeter camera lens, you often find that taking flats with a, a flat panel just doesn't seem to work very well. I, I think it's probably the internal reflections that cause trouble. But taking sky flats tends to work very, very well for uh, camera lenses. Mm. Okay. And so when I was taking those photographs you saw in my uh, background uh, um, screen, um, the flats I took for those were sky flats. And what I ended up doing was pointing the camera at the sky and then moving the camera around in a sort of circular or spiral pattern so that any stars that were visible in the twilight sky were gonna end up as long uh, streaks and then when stacking lots of these together with data rejection, all the, uh, uh, the non-uniform things in the, in the background sky ended up being rejected and you end up with a, a very successful uh, master flat. Oh. Okay. And I think that's how the professionals take their flats as well um, sometimes. I think uh, with the bigger telescopes, that can be easier to do that. Than so to is, that, that. is that done at twilight or can it be... Because you have, you've got to have some lightness there, haven't you? That's right. It has to be at twilight because okay. if it was complete darkness, not only would you need a ridiculously long time to take the flat, it would also be full of stars. Mm -hmm. So you need a, a brightish sky so that the, uh, the sky brightness is more significant than the star brightness. So uh, twilight often works quite well. Although with a DSLR, you could actually take the photograph in, in daylight if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. With a telescope, you probably couldn't. Um, but the critical thing is the focus has to be the same. And of course, sky flats are free. Yes. <laughs> but you don't know if you're focused or not. That's in any trouble. <laughs> yes. So uh, the idea then is if you take them on the same night, and that's why the twilight works quite well, then you can, uh, if you focused it, uh, on something far away or, or a, the, a crescent moon or a, a bright star that's just appeared, um, then the sky flat can mm. work. Or perhaps in the dawn sky when you're finished. And they say the orientation has to be just the same, isn't it? Which I guess is harder because every time you fit the camera back onto your scope, the orientation is not going to be 100% the same. That's right. Yes, the orientation needs to be uh, exactly the same. So really, you need to do it before you remove your camera from the uh, uh, telescope. Mm. John, do you mind if I ask a question? Sure. So um, colour and colour balance on flats. Um, why does, why in principle should it matter if what you're interested in is the luminance? Why does it have to be a white sheet and not a different colour? Right. Or, um, to answer another question is if you're shooting in one shot colour, then obviously um, when you're working with those flats, are you debarring them out into colour images or working with the raw pixels? Right. OK, so um, the whenever we calibrate the images, uh, when we are applying uh, the uh, master darks, when we're applying the, uh, the master flat, uh, 
we're always working on the uh, raw CFA image. We, we never debay it, in, debay it into a color image before the calibration. We must always do it on the raw, raw data. Once we've converted it into a, a color image, uh, a lot of the information is lost um, and it can't really be effectively done very well after that. Okay, so it's the point of it being white in that you should uh, basically uh, pass through the debayering filter and illuminate all of the RGGB pixels more or less the same. So if you went for a color, so if you went for a slightly different colored um, or, or an off color balance, then you would end up having a bias of pixels and then you'd end up with a patterning in your. So um, yes, you're on, you're on the right lines there. Yeah. Um, so um, the color's not critical. So for example, if you're taking sky flats, the sky is blue. Uh, at night, at twilight, we might not be able to see that it's blue because our, our, uh, our color vision degrades in, in, uh, in the dark, but it is still blue. So your sky flats will end up with a blue image. So it's not critical, but we, if, if we can, we go for a white image because we want to expose all the different colors on our camera um, fairly evenly. Okay, um, which is why the iPad works. That's right, yes, indeed. Okay. Um, the other aspect is that um, the flat field, um, the exposure that we end up using, um, ideally, we want the image to be as bright as possible because a bright image will uh, have far less noise in it. So the, uh, the random arrival of photons is insignificant if the image is bright and whatever tiny amounts of noise our camera has introduced is insignificant if the image is bright. So we prefer bright images, but there's a snag. We also have to remain within the linear response of the camera. Yeah. Now, fortunately, our um, detectors are amazingly linear. They're incredibly linear, it's, it's fantastic. But um, with the, um, there's, a, there's a problem with uh, having a, a completely linear sensor, which the image I've just moved on to actually illustrates. So this was taken with, uh, with my camera, which is referred to as a, a non-anti-blooming camera. Um, and what that means is that um, it produces blooming spikes. So if we see this bright star on the uh, lower, lower right, mm -hmm. we can see that we've ended up with this uh, nasty uh, blooming spike uh, above and below the, uh, the star. And what's happened there is the pixels um, at the center of the star have ended up filling up, the, the, the pixel wells have filled up completely and then the electrons have overflowed out of the top of the well. And as they've overflowed, they've ended up going down the column of pixels and the next pixel ends up getting this avalanche of uh, electrons and then that overflows. And if the star is bright enough, we end up with quite a big blooming spike of all these saturated pixels. Uh, and this is how um, most uh, professional cameras are, are set up just like uh, mine is. And there's two reasons for this. Uh, one is that um, if we, we can prevent this by adding extra circuitry onto the uh, camera. And what that does is as the signal gets, um, as the electron wells get uh, to be almost full, we end up draining off the uh, electrons so that the well never overflows. But there's two disadvantages to that. One is that the circuitry ends up taking extra space on the uh, surface of our chip. And that means there's less active area for each pixel for uh, uh, the light to actually uh, uh, hit. So there's a concern that it could reduce the, uh, the sensitivity of the camera. Um, and the other problem is that by draining off the uh, um, excess electrons, we're making the camera less linear. So what we typically find is that um, cameras will be linear up until about two thirds of their uh, dynamic range. And uh, the last third, when the uh, electrons starting to start to be uh, drained away, ends up being progressively uh, uh, less linear. Uh, 
So typically, you, you probably want to be uh, setting the flat brightness to be uh, in the order of about two thirds of your uh, um, detector's maximum brightness. And that reduces your noise. Does that uh, answer your question? How would you find out yeah. what your sensor's dynamic range is? So if you check the, uh, if you look at a bright star in your image, mm -hmm. um, uh, if you have, say, uh, a couple of really bright stars in the image, if both of them end up maxing out on the same uh, value, so uh, often you'll have a, a readout on the cursor so you can see what uh, uh, ADU value on the uh, image is. And if they both max out at the same value, then that's the uh, where the camera is saturated. Um, so sometimes that will be the... Uh, um, the maximum um, number that the camera can store. So for instance, if you've got a 12-bit camera, uh, I think that means, my, my mental arithmetic's not great, but I think that means that the two to the 12 is probably, um, is it 1,024? Um, but anyway, if it was, then that would be the, uh, the maximum value. So you'd want two thirds of that value. With a 16-bit camera, it's going to be 2 to the 16, which I think is around about 65,500 and something. Um, but some cameras end up uh, saturating slightly below their uh, maximum uh, readout value. So it's a case of a bit of experimentation and uh, see what the maximum value you can ever get in an image is. Does that make uh, sense? Mm -hmm. But it, it'll always be fairly close to the maximum value that your format can uh, can store. Um, so with mine, I think it's uh, probably 10,000 less than the maximum, but my camera is probably a little unusual there. We can also see various other things on this uh, image. This is an individual image, it's not been stacked. And we see we've got a, a satellite trail on it. We um, It has been calibrated, but... Um, or maybe it hasn't actually. We, we can still see uh, hot pixels and we can also see some of these uh, cosmic ray strikes uh, as well. So once it's been calibrated, most of these um, hot pixels will uh, disappear. That's part of the fixed pattern noise that we're removing. But the brighter hot pixels will tend to leave a residue. And that's because a bright um, hot pixel there's some uncertainty as to how bright it will be. It's a sort of slightly random effect, a bit like the uh, shot noise that we were talking about earlier. So although you'll be subtracting the average value that hot pixel usually has, it will typically perhaps be a little bit above or a little bit below that. So you'll still end up with a few hot pixels after you've done the subtraction. And cameras can also have random hot pixels as well. So those, those would remain. So we've got various um, uh, problems on our, our fully calibrated image. And uh, it's those problems that we're going to be trying to um, get rid of when we do our image stacking. And that's where I'm sure the uh, software that, you're, um, uh, that you've got, uh, that you've sorted out, Keith, I imagine that that's probably got some rejection methods uh -huh. that you can apply when you're stacking. Uh, and this is really important. The, the key objective is to have the rejection high enough so you can reject things like the satellite trail, you can reject things like the uh, cosmic ray strikes, and you can reject the um, what remains of the hot pixels. But you definitely don't want to be rejecting the general um, uh, shot noise in the background, the uh, sort of uh, salt and pepper, um, uh, what looks like random noise, but actually isn't. That's the uh, the random arrival of the photons. We desperately want to keep as much as that as possible. It's real signal. So you should never overdo the data rejection. Try and keep as much of that, what looks like background noise as possible. Uh, only go after the things that are, are obviously not part of the, uh, the random arrival of photons. Satellite trails, cosmic ray strikes, what remains of those uh, brighter hot pixels. So typically, I tend to try and reject somewhere between half a percent and uh, five percent 
of the uh, pixels in an image and any more than that and really you start to uh, reject things that shouldn't be rejected things that will build up into a proper signal So we've been talking about uh, Bayer, Bayer arrays and color cameras a little bit. So this is a, a cartoon that tries to explain what's going on. So we have the, the gray um, uh, squares and these are the actual uh, pixel uh, detectors. These are the pixel wells. And the, uh, the actual detector itself, they only make uh, mono detectors. We don't have uh, detectors that can uh, tell the difference between green, red, and uh, blue light. So what they do instead is they put an array of um, color filters on top of the pixels. And hence, um, of every four pixels, um, you'll have one blue pixel, one red pixel, and two green pixels. And obviously they'll, uh, the, the black and white detector underneath will only detect the light of the uh, color of filter. Um, so this is enormously convenient, but it also means that um, it comes with downsides as well. So for instance, we can see that the resolution of our detector is no longer the size of one of our gray squares. Um, it can be, it's considerably less because a lot of our detail ends up uh, being lost because we've effectively turned uh, our images into uh, blocks of four. So we have an image on the left. This is actually from the, uh, the uh, IRIS uh, software um, uh, website. The image on the left is uh, taken with a digital camera and that's been uh, properly uh, debayered into a color image. We can see the image on the right and this is uh, looking at the raw image. Um, exactly as the mono sensor underneath the, uh, the filters took it. And hopefully you can see that we've got a very gritty effect going on. And that's where the, um, some of the uh, pixels have uh, far less exposure because if something was uh, a particular color, we're, we're gonna get more light say through the, uh, the red uh, um, filter and less through the blue. So we'll end up with a, a dark um, square in the, uh, in the image. Um, so because of this, we've reduced the resolution of our uh, camera by going for mono. So they'll still say that, oh yeah, this is a 20 megapixel camera, but in effect, we've almost reduced it to a quarter of that. Our real resolution is more like a, a five megapixel camera. And when they debayer it, they end up reinterpolating uh, the final image to resize it from a quarter size to full size. So that's one downside of color is your, so, your real resolution is lower. So does debayering then, would that then average the pixels around it to fill in those black dots? Kind of yes. Um, so you could do it in several different ways. So a really primitive way of doing it would be you could, um, uh, for instance, for the red pixels, you could say, well, they, they, um, they occur once every four pixels. I'll just pick out those, those uh, pixels from the image and create an image that's a quarter of the original size. Okay, you're right, yes. Uh, so you, and you could do the same with the blue. Could, and uh, the, it, yeah. the green one, it would be just uh, half the size of the image because you've got two green pixels for uh, every block of four. And then when you reconstruct the color from this RGB data, you would then upsample it back to the original size image and you would end up um, resampling it to uh, in invent the uh, missing data. And then you'd apply a bit of sharpening to make it look as if uh, it was still a 20 megapixel camera. Now, in reality, they're a bit more sophisticated than that. So it's not quite as bad as I'm making out. And you're right, they do some clever interpolation uh, to try and retain as much data as possible. But nonetheless, you have reduced the resolution in a significant way by having a color camera. Uh, 
and nobody actually knows what the debayering algorithms are um, because they vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. They keep them incredibly secret, which is why if you pick up a Canon camera and a Nikon camera and set them to exactly the same settings and plonk them in a raw converter, um, each raw converter will do it slightly differently. But the JPEGs that you get out of those two different cameras may well end up with uh, very different color balances between them because uh, the, the internal debayering is, uh, is a bit of a black art as far as the outside world is concerned. And those manufacturers do keep those algorithms very top secret. Yes, because it's a, an ill-defined problem. You're trying to recreate data that you've effectively lost. You're trying yep. to figure out where the, what value this, this picture, what red should value this like. picture should have when, when it had a blue filter over that pixel. So mm. you're, you're trying to recreate something that you're guessing the, the value. And then you've got all sorts of other problems. What if the blue pixel was saturated? Um, what do you do? Uh, you've still got data from the green and red. Um, so there's lots of decisions to be made and, and you're right, it, it's complicated. And yeah. if it's running into the nonlinear part of the camera, what do you do? And there's all sorts of, uh, yeah, it, it's complicated. And this is all managed by the camera? In yes, the so for instance. If, if you take a JPEG image, then it's the camera's onboard chips that will be doing this conversion. And it's got a lot of work to do. It's got to decide where the black point's going to be. It's got to decide where the white point is. It's going to have to decide how much uh, stretch to put on the image. It's going to have to decide the, the colors from the debayering. It's going to have to figure out what the color balance is due to the lighting, whether it's tungsten or, or daylight or cloudy. It's got a huge amount of work to do. And camera manufacturers are, are very, very uh, uh, keen to get the best algorithm. Ooh. And that's what the chips on your camera are doing. They have no impact on the raw image that we as astrophotographers are interested in. It has nothing to do with that whatsoever. It's all to do with converting that raw into a JPEG. You can also do that on, in software on the computer. Ooh. And then, uh, yes, it'll be uh, the computer that will uh, run through the uh, algorithms to do that, which in theory ought to give a better result because they have more computing power so there's more scope for doing clever things, I suppose. Uh, whereas the camera's got to be fairly quick at it. But the chips they've developed on, on camera are getting very, very clever these days. Uh, and the reviews tend to concentrate on them, the, the camera reviews. And from our point of view, we prefer that the chip did nothing at all because it'll heat up the camera. If we could turn them off completely, uh, which perhaps we're doing, but effectively doing by taking just raw. Um, the, uh, the chips aren't needed, they're not being used. And less heat is good. Um, but there's a, another um, effect that this uh, Bay Array has. So here, this graph, uh, this was also taken from the uh, IRIS uh, website. Uh, it's um, showing the, uh, quantum the geometric quantum efficiency of um, uh, several different cameras. So the top line is the same camera that I have, um, which uh, its uh, efficiency, at its peak efficiency is just over 80%, which when you think about it is amazing. It's detecting 80% uh, of the photons that actually land on the, uh, on the detector. That is awesome. That is actually really quite close to the perfect camera. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, we then look at the um, DSLR cameras, which are color sensors, and we can see they're way down in the weeds. They look rubbish in comparison, um, but they're not rubbish. Um, the actual sensors themselves are inc still incredibly good, but, because um, half the pixels, only half the pixels are green, the maximum efficiency, if the uh, detector was 100% quantum efficiency, is 50%, because you're throwing away all the uh, photons that arrived on the blue and red uh, filters. Yeah. With the 
red and blue is even worse. You're throwing away all the red and blue photons that arrive. Um, so yeah, we're only getting a quarter uh, of the uh, blue photons and a quarter of the red. So some of this difference between the, uh, uh, these lines, part of it is because this is a professional grade sensor and it really is amazingly sensitive. Um, but most of the difference is simply because you've, uh, the DSLR had a color sensor and hence it's throwing away so much light because the color filters block it. So you pay quite a heavy price for going for a color camera. It adds all sorts of convenience, but it comes at a great cost. Now, it's not quite as bad as I've made out here um, because it does have an advantage that if you want a color image, you've taken that all in one shot. Whereas with the mono camera, you've got to take the luminance and then you've got to take the red, green and blue. So you've got to take more, more imaging time to get the same information. And that readdresses the balance a bit, but it doesn't make up for the difference because you don't have to take that much RGB data in order to get a good quality uh, color image. So um, yeah, you'll never compete with the uh, um, uh, signal to noise ratio with the same imaging time uh, with a mono camera as a, a color camera. So yes, it's very convenient. You don't need to buy the, uh, the color filters, um, but yeah, coming at a cost. Um, other um, aspects, um, uh, lost my train of thought now. Um, so um, yeah, I remember now. So the other problem with uh, color cameras is that they've chosen green to be the pixel that has uh, a doubling up. So for every block of four, we've got two green pixels. But for astronomy images, it's the red and the blue that we tend to be most interested in. The red, because that's what uh, emission nebula are brightest in, and the blue because uh, uh, emission nebula. And stars like uh, galaxies or, or star clusters, they are uh, um, emit as a continuum. So it doesn't matter which one's the most sensitive for, uh, for stars and galaxies. So if we were designing a, an astronomy uh, camera from scratch, ideally, we'd really like two red pixels, <laughs> a one green and a blue. It's, it's wrong for what we're after, which is a shame. The reason all DSLRs are like this is because the eye is most sensitive to green light. It, it dominates our vision. So cameras end up uh, duplicating that. Um, Um, then we have other downsides of having a color camera, and that's really when we start using narrowband filters. And uh, then uh, if you put in a narrowband hydrogen alpha filter, you're only using one in four pixels. So you're taking a major hit on the resolution and on the uh, sensitivity. So you kind of probably are getting the, uh, the idea now that um, you can probably understand why professionals never use color cameras. They, they always go for black and white, that there are good reasons for them doing so. Um, this is uh, showing a progression of uh, how far we've come. So this graph is showing uh, the quantum efficiency of various different detectors. And we've got this line down here at the bottom which is the, the very best, fastest uh, black and white film uh, available. Um, and we can see that it, in comparison, its uh, sensitivity is just rubbish. And then we've got professional uh, CCD cameras, which are getting very close to our uh, ideal camera from the sensitivity point of view. And I think with time, amateur, ca amateur uh, detectors are getting closer and closer to the uh, professional uh, uh, efficiency. Now, I think, uh, um, yeah, I, I think it's not uncommon now to get uh, above 75% uh, uh, efficiency from uh, uh, amateur uh, cameras. Whereas when I first started, 50% uh, was considered really, really good for an amateur camera. Uh, 
So uh, they've come on a, a long way, all in all. And this, this slide is a bit off topic, but I thought that if you're beginning uh, astrophotography, you probably don't have a dome. So you're probably setting up outside every night. And in the days that I used to do that, I uh, found that setting up and tearing down just took ages. And uh, so what I ended up doing was all the electronics that I needed, I ended up putting in a, a big plastic box such that it was all plugged in together with itself. And then uh, I just needed to take uh, um, a wiring loom up from the box and then plug that in to the various things on the uh, actual telescope and camera. And I found that that saved me a, a huge amount of time. And perhaps more importantly still, it reduced the number of errors that I made as I was setting up. Um, so I, I would thoroughly recommend this uh, practice uh, um, for yourselves. I, so, I, funny enough, John, I do exactly the same. Yeah, so. wise move. It also meant I could, in winter when it was cold, I could uh, close the lid as well, which kept the uh, dew off the equipment as well. So 